Hi, I'm Vedan from Georgia Tech, and I'm going to share what information workers think about using passive sensing enabled AI to gain insight into their performance and well being. I'm interested in information workers because, unlike other kinds of work roles, it always has been very hard to evaluate this kind of brain work, mostly because there's never been a fungible output. This leads to a gap between what organizations think is good for them and what really is best for these workers. That's why we're witnessing problems like quiet quitting, where workers feel less motivated to work because their overall needs are not being cared for. That's the reason why we need better insights of their performance and well-being. And typically, worker management has relied on surveys. But these surveys are confined to measure traits that are very hard to change. They're also burdensome to measure frequently. And they cannot reflect all kinds of behaviors. So this leads to some kinds of alternatives. And researchers such as me, we've actually explored the potential of leveraging everyday digital technology as passive sensors of daily behavior. These approaches are automatic, unobtrusive, and require low effort from the user. And that's why it's possible to model daily behaviors like physical activity, screen usage, or sleep. And then we can build machine learning applications to generate insights on performance and well-being. Collectively, I refer to these approaches as passive sensing enabled AI or PSI. These kinds of tools capture many aspects that affect our work experience. And arguably, this approach is not vulnerable to the same subjective biases as surveys. The behavioral nature of this data can also provide actionable insight for workers to change. But PSI for work are different from that for personal use. Workplaces have power inequities between the worker and the employees. Someone else having your information can actually cost you your livelihood. And that actually makes the incentives of sharing data for Psi quite unclear compared to say sharing data with Fitbit for your own health. Yet many workers might be subject to Psi in future and this can just worsen the asymmetry. We need Psi to work for workers and not the other way around. In this study, we conducted interviews to learn the expectations that information workers have for such technology. We explained the contextual norms of deploying SI in information work by exploring the perspectives of 28 different individuals. And through our research, we hope to improve how SI is developed, how it will be deployed, and how it can actually be regulated. So we recruited information workers within the US, and these workers had experience before COVID-19. So they had experience working both on site as well as remote. They will span many different kinds of roles, as well as different kinds of sectors, for example, IT, finance, consulting, manufacturing, and healthcare. To capture a variety of possible near-term SI implementations, we created text-based scenarios inspired by real technology. Scenarios help find the socio-technical bounds of a futuristic application such as SI. We showed participants pairs so that they could rationalize underlying features by comparing and contrasting. Take an example of one of the pairs they saw. One uses occupancy sensors, while the other uses application logins. The PSI also differ in other dimensions, such as how they model the data and who receives the information. Note, these were only starting points and participants were free to reimagine PSI. Each participant was shown three such pairs and that was to help them appreciate a range of possibilities. Note that information workers are already aware about some technologies that evaluate performance and well-being. Project management software such as Jira, GitHub, or the screenshot over here, ProtoScore, are already out there. Digital tools for worker well-being such as Viva Insights also exist. However, SAI that we're suggesting is a little different because it gathers different kinds of data, and it's also algorithmically determining insights. That's why we look at the contextual integrity framework that helps explain emergent use cases of new information flows such as SAI. So after we had completed the open coding of our interview transcripts, we reoriented our themes according to the contextual integrity framework. So to see if contextual integrity is upheld, we first need to talk about the norms of appropriateness. And I will be discussing two of these in my talk, and the third one is described in the paper. So we know that the blurring work-life boundaries in information work has called into question the social contract between a worker and their organization. It's unclear where that contract ends. This complicates implementations of SI in terms of how the data has been gathered. For some people, the boundary is very discreet. P8 over here mentions the distinction is based on physical space. The home is where the buck stops. And for P17, it's the digital space. SI needs to be limited to certain devices. Therefore, for these workers, SI outside work encroach their privacy. But it's not just about privacy. Consider P8, who we had just met earlier. 
they actually also felt that work-specific scoping had a bonus. It was more accurate and more useful in terms of what kind of changes they could make at work. But let's look at P6. They represented an alternative kind of view. Learning outside factors was bringing to attention certain unforeseen aspects, which they were ignoring before. That was their point of view. In fact, that point of view forms the crux of the social ecological model, an idea that is a key scientific motivation to develop psi for understanding performance and well-being. Interestingly, some workers like P7 felt that ignoring the work context might be even safer. She was even more willing to accept psi if it is just entirely peripheral to her work context. We learned that certain psi might be holistic, but it might not be adopted because of how workers separate their work and life. Second, the mixing of physical spaces and devices blurs the boundaries. So ultimately, we need to think of methods to give workers ways to express their boundary and control the use of psi. Now, let's talk about the norms around job consequences. We earlier saw that P6 was concerned about psi gathering data in a work context, but it's not just where the data is collected, but who receives that insight. Workers described destructive uses of psi. P3 felt it could be used to stifle their promotion, other workers also pointed out that if they chose not to use Psy, they might fall, fall behind those who do. However, we also observed a counterpoint supporting Psy. Notice the quotes by P2 and P14. They both felt that Psy could be an illuminating tool. P14 felt that her role was misunderstood and Psy could help express her effort. This idea was echoed by others as a way to use objective data as collateral information to seek changes. P17 felt he could justify his resources, for example, the need to hire another PM or express the burden of working at his own limit. So in this way, Psy could actually help workers contest changes in their work. For this to happen, we need to think beyond nudges and individual change. We need to find a way that Psy can actually enable a worker to say, I need a break. Importantly, this shows an opportunity where workers can keep the organizations accountable by comparing and collecting their insights from Psy. Now, let's move on to the other norm that needs to be upheld, which is norms of distribution. In this talk, I will only be focusing on one kind of distribution norm, but the paper, of course, has more details. So much like personal users of Psy, workers would want to actually be the sole receiver of insights. However, our participants also understood why sharing these insights for Psy could be needed or even desirable in the context of information work. They describe both one-to-one -one and many-to-many -many sharing, and I'm mostly going to be focusing on the one-to-one -one part. P20 felt that without additional guidance or coaching, she might actually harm herself if she's the sole receiver of an insight from Psy. So this guidance that they need, that should ideally be through trusted co-workers like seniors, mentors, or managers. However, sharing does not imply unfiltered and uncontrolled flow of information to the other stakeholder. That can make the worker even more vulnerable. Instead, our participants envisioned different approaches. P11 wanted to receive the information first so that she could improve before an evaluation. P15 thought that he might be able to explain and situate the algorithmic insights better before passing it on to someone else. Essentially, these insights can be treated analogous to an issue given to an information worker. They are responsible for working on it, and if they need additional support, they can escalate it to someone else who can work with them for their own benefit. These flows also have other considerations that we discuss further in our paper. Taken together, to mitigate the misappropriations of Psy, we need to consider more human-in-the-loop solutions and set up affordances that allow workers to reinterpret any Psy insight with their subjective experiences. Other stakeholders can also be a part of this loop, and they can play a similar, similar role in explaining Psy to the worker. Collectively, our paper has four broad guidelines and directions to encourage better designs of information flows for Psy. For the most part, our study discussed the worker, their organization, and the developers of Psy. But before I wrap up, I wanted to call to attention the importance of our findings for two other key stakeholders, the regulators and researchers. Even if regulators do not understand the black box of sensing, by looking at some of our guidelines and directions, they can start benchmarking applications against these. And for researchers like me, we need to start looking at ways to involve participants and involve them in our modeling throughout the entire life cycle, not just the data collection part. In our paper, we extensively discuss these points, but that's all I have for the talk now. Please read our paper for more details, and if you have any questions, do drop me an email. I wanted to thank all my co-authors for making this effort possible, and thank you for listening.